This is a lecture on Hess's law. Hess's law is nothing more than an application of state functions. Today I'm going to spend time on heat of formation and enthalpy and later on in other lectures we'll talk about Gibbs free energy and we'll talk about um, entropy. Okay, absolute entropy here. So Hess's law is an application of using, and today anyway, uh, the state function of enthalpy. Enthalpy is delta H, formerly known as the heat of reaction that you may have seen in lower level chem courses, or the heat of solution, heat of combustion. Okay, it's got a lot of synonyms, but uh, any case that always, and that would be a U there, and all, in any case, all it really means is it's a state function where the starting and final positions we only care about. It's not a path function. So let's take a step back and understand where it came from before we talk about the greatest application of this state function of entropy, which is Hess's law. So where did it come from? Well, we know that energy is equal to the first law of thermodynamics equals to the Q, or I should say the thermal energy, the heat, okay, plus the work of a system. All right, so the change of energy is equal to the work, the work done by or on the system and the heat it gains or releases. Now, delta E is a state function, and it's, these values are pathways to get the total E. Now, we're going to spend our time on is constant pressure scenario. So we're going to use this Q of P, which means the thermal energy in constant pressure scenarios. So let's solve for it here. And when we do so, Q of P is equal to delta E plus the work. Now, we have defined work in other lectures as equal to the work of the system equals the negative work of the surroundings, and the surroundings has a opposing pressure. And we've learned that thermal expansion, or the expansion due to gases, is the work done in our systems. So we know that the work is equal to negative pressure change of volume. So we plug this in, Q of P is equal to delta E minus P delta V. Now, we've got this expression that energy, thermal energy, which is unfortunately a path function because it's Q, is equal to these state functions. So what we did, party people, is we said, well, let's make a new thermodynamic quantity called delta H, and let's, because this delta H is made up of other state functions, we can treat this value, of course, as a state function. So delta H is equal to the Q of P in constant pressure scenarios. That's why we can do calorimetry okay, in isobaric conditions and get the Q value equal to the delta H. What, the reason that I spent a little bit of time on this again is to help you remember that this is an important state function delta H. And because of the state function, I am able to use it unlike path functions. Maybe you've learned about potential energy curves, where we have reactants and we have products. And we have this energy change. And we know if it's exothermic, that the energy overall drops. Now the blue line represents the path. How we get there really is no consequence as long as we know what the initial and the final. And the difference of those two is your change of H. In this case it's negative because the product's energy level is lower than the reactant. These are more stable. So because we're creating more stable products, lower in overall energy, than the reactants, we had to release energy. Energy was lost, and that's where we get this negative value. Negatives and positives are, are very important quantities in this unit. But, again, from your previous chem course, or maybe your current one, when you add a catalyst to reaction, a lot of times it could lower okay, this value. It could change this pathway. It can actually have inhibitors that go up 
You don't have to. So this pathway can also change by a catalyst or an inhibitor. And again, it doesn't matter to me. It doesn't change the change of the, of the uh, overall delta H at all. But there's something even more powerful with that. Because it's a state function and I don't have to consider the pathway, I don't have to consider all the different variables or all the different pieces of equipment that you used and what temperature was when you did that step and the second step. All this information of how you got there is totally insignificant really uh, to me as long as I know the conditions of the final and I'm sorry, the uh, the uh, initial and final state. So I don't have to consider all these details to get that position. Kind of like if I said, how did you get home today? Well, the bus took um, me home, but it went to 10 different stops first. And if I said, what's the distance between at school at home? That would be like delta H, but the actual pathway you take is all the different stops and I don't need to know all different stops the bottom line what was the distance from the school to your home and you would say that's your delta H I don't care how long it took because you went all these other places if that is a good analogy and I'm not really sure okay what is this delta H of F though this delta H of F is a heat of formation now it's again delta H has a bunch of different synonyms but by writing a delta H of F I'm denoting a certain type of reaction. So delta H of F with a little zero means I'm dealing with something called the heat of formation. When I form this compound from its elements, this is the delta H change. Now, because methane is negative 74.6, it tells me that heat was released from the system. So if you look at methane, we would make methane CH4. Understand this. In a table of heats of formation, all of these compounds here represent the products of a formation or synthesis reaction made from its elemental states. What's the elemental state of the components of methane? Well, you have carbon and you have hydrogen. But because hydrogen is diatomic naturally in its elemental state, you would have to write H2. That's very important that you recognize your diatomic elements, which I call the Hofbrinkles. All the Hofbrinkles, okay, and I got this probably from some other teacher years ago, is H2, O2, F2, Br2, I2, N2, Cl2. These guys, so when I say hydrogen or oxygen or fluorine or bromide, iodine, nitrogen or chlorine, okay, if I say the, ele the element, its elemental state is its diatomic state, so I have to write H2. And then, of course, I balance. We balance so that we have one of these, right? De delta H is a state function. It's not a path. We have to tell its initial state and where it came from. So I'm going to throw a 2 here. So this is the reaction that this that um, is implied by writing this in a table with delta heats of formation. This is the implied. So if you think with me for a second, C2H6 has carbon and H2 and some different ratio, but these are all what? These are all products, and you have the reactants over here. So it's implied. Two Cs plus, if you want to do this with me, uh, three H2s, and so forth. So these are all reactants. And when they are made from their elements, elemental states, very important, elemental states, okay, this is the energy change. Now you should know when things are bonded, energy is always uh, always released when you form a bond from the elements. So you may say, Mr. Grotsky, well, how come some of these delta H's are positive? Well, if you notice, this would be two C's that made it plus, guess what, an H2 that made this compound. That's the implied reactants for that compound. So you just made something that was, guess what, more unstable than the elemental form. Most things when they bond, okay, are more stable. And that's why the delta H's, if you look down here, most of them are negative. There's going to be some that are positive, okay, and they are actually more stable. So what's going on here in these, these heats of formation? Well, as I said before, you have the elemental states. And the elemental states are the states 
that the atoms in before they're bonded, or they're the states that they exist naturally before they form a bond. You notice chlorine here has an elemental state of zero. It's one of my Hofbrinkles. That means that chlorine free ion, uh, free uh, radicals, sometimes they call them, or atoms, don't exist naturally. They're too unstable. They're going to bond with each other to form that Cl2 that we talked about. So they're going to be formed like this. And you may say, well, why don't we consider this? Because that's really unstable. They'll, they find some kind of stability. So atoms that can bond with each other do so, and we consider them to have zero heats of formation because they form without us giving them any energy or noticing the energy. Sometimes you can say they were formed during the Big Bang, if you want to go that far. So all elements that are listed on our tables, whether they're standalone elements like carbon, were formed way before we put them in reactions, so we give them a zero. Now, diamonds, of course, need a lot of energy pressure, mostly, and some heat to form them. That's why they're endothermic. They're definitely more unstable. In the so if we look at the elemental states, and any a heat of formation table is going to show you that all of these elemental states have zero heats of formation. All right, so if we look at, specifically, let's look at hydrochloric acid gas. If it's, if it's listed, what it really means is that HCl, when it's made from its elements, hydrogen and chlorine, which by the way are diatomic elements, I have to go H2 and what? Cl2. And to balance this, I'm going to need to have a 2 in front. Okay, now if you notice, this is a 1 to 1 to 2 rate ratio. And since this delta, this table that we're looking at is kilojoules per every mole. So when they do this type of um, reactions called a synthesis or formation reaction, they have to do it per one mole. So what they will see is they'll put a half here, half here, and that will make that become one HCl. Sounds strange, but that's how they do it. So half a mole of each. And I say, well, how do they do a half? Well, essentially, it's really one hydrogen and one chlorine that are combining. So that's how they do that. And then that's how they measure it per one mole. Remember, delta H is not Q. Q is a pathway. So delta H has to have a what? A starting, some firm positioning in its information. And kilojoules is just heat, but kilojoules per mole tells me a firm position of where I stand in my state. Okay, something to think about. But getting back to the application of what we call Hess law, well, Hess law works because these elemental states that we're talking about that would go up, go up here, Cl2, H2, if it's an uncombined element or element that's not a diatomic like copper atoms or you know sodium atoms, what we're saying is that these are all the baselines. Okay, so all of these elements in their elemental states, where they're bonded to each other diatomically or monoatomic, okay, this is the baseline. This is where we start from. This is our zero line. Okay, this is where all the elements exist and their energy levels. Now, they're not all the same, but it's good enough to, to, to work from that position. So we're going to go from the elemental states that we assign a zero to. So we have physically signed a zero, even though it takes some energy to be released when Cl, okay, atoms combine to make uh, uh, chlorine atoms. But we assign a zero to these elemental states, so this becomes our official baseline. And we can do that. We can assign a zero anywhere we like. So we sign it with the baseline when they're in these positions. And this is my fixed starting position of my state function for my what? Delta or for my enthalpy. This is my fixed position. This is my defined thermal, okay, fixed starting or delta H, okay, initial. All right. Or I should say that, I should before I say delta H initial, just uh, enthalpy initial, if you want to think of it that way. Now, if I form something from the elements, as I've talked about, most things are formed, okay, become more stable, so they lose energy, so their delta H's are negative to show that. For instance, hydrochloric acid, okay, starts from the what? 
starts from the elemental states to make HCl. And that energy change from here to this state right here is my, this would be H final and F minus I gives us a delta H that's negative. Okay, this is my zero. All right. And we have a negative value. Now, why is it negative? It's negative thermodynamically because energy is released. And there it is. It's negative 92.3. Let me get rid of these final initials. I just don't want to confuse that. So the reason we come up with these negatives or positives are to talk about clearly the directionality. Okay, so again, how is this really important? Well, if I know the heat of formation of hydrochloric acid, all right, and I know the heat of formation of, let's say, NaOH. And if I magically go to a heat of formation table, like I have right here, and I find sodium hydroxide solid, I see the heat of formation is negative 425.6. Okay. And you see that solids are going to have a much higher heat of formation than gases. If you can find some gases. Okay, we'll see that gases have much, much lower heats of formation. Solids are more stable, silly rabbits. So look at iodine gas. In fact, this gas is positive when it's formed. That means it's really more unstable than the free iodine ions. Okay, look at hydrogen gas. Well, that's, of course, elemental. Okay, but gases, okay, hydrofluoric gas in this case, is much, much lower than the solid sodium. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. So getting back to sodium hydroxide, it's under S for sodium, okay, we get 425.6. So when sodium hydroxide is formed from its elements, and this won't be drawn to scale, obviously, this change downward would equal a delta H equal to negative 425.6. Point six, and of course the units are kilojoule per mole. So is this one. All right, and of course I'm making NaOH from its what? From its elements. That means pure sodium, pure oxygen. Hey, it's a diatomic. Pure hydrogen. Hey, it's a di diatomic. Okay, gives me NaOH. Got to balance. All right, so these would go to halves, and I would get one mole. So these are the elemental states that are up here designated as zero. Okay, so what can we do with these? Well, my friend in chemistry, these are the collective heat so formation of the products. All right, and what's interesting is if I know the heat so formation of my reactants, and I know the heat so formation of my products, what I can do is I can actually help figure out what the heat of reaction is, the total change in the reaction. Let me say, well, how do I do that? Well, I need to know the heats of formation of my reactants now, of my products. So these are my two reactants. Let's do HCl, which should have been red, but hey, plus NaOH. Okay, very simple acid-base reaction. As we all know, it's going to make sodium chloride aqueous plus, okay, water. All right, so let's go find the heat of formation of water, okay? Okay, negative 285.83. So the heat of formation is negative 285.83 kilojoules per mole, okay? And, of course, negative... 425.6 kilojoules per mole for the sodium hydroxide. So H2O liquid is not as stable as, guess what, NaOH solid. That's for sure. Okay, crystals in a regular repeating geometric pattern called a crystal lattice are going to be much stronger in all directions because of the strength of the crystals. So this makes a lot of sense. Now, what else do we make? We made the sodium, we made the water liquid. Now we're going to make sodium chloride aqueous. So let's go find those values. Now, sodium chloride aqueous is really sodium ions and chlorine ions. They're not really bonded together. They're actually having these 
ion molecule attractions that I famously call famous boyfriend, famous girlfriend. So they really are freed. So sodium plus and chloride ions. So the sodium ion is negative 240.3. And the chlorine ion in sodium chloride aqueous, again, is not really bonded. It has the molecule uh, ion attractions, okay, is negative 167. So when we look at the baseline of elemental states and we look at all the individual heats of formation, some are ions, some are compounds, some are solids, liquids, and some more aqueous ions and gases. We look at the collective um, uh, heats of formations of the entire reaction. What we're going to get is, and if you look at the reaction, you'll get the following. Here's the reaction. Hydrochloric acid gas plus sodium hydroxide. So these are my reactants. And if I look at the collective heats of formation, remember these are state functions. So if I look at the collective heats of formations, I get negative 92.3 for the hydrochloric acid, and it's a reactant. So I'm looking at the overall energy of the reactants in terms of the heats of formation of reactants. I also have sodium hydroxide solid, and there it is, and that's a bigger jump. So the solid is more stable than the gas, so obviously it's negative 425.6, and there it is here, and I add them together. It's collective heats of formation. This is the total amount of energy that's released when we form these from their elements. And I get a total energy of negative 517 when I look at that energy. Now, if I look at the products, H2O liquid, that's negative 285.83. We're getting this from tablature. That's why we get that delta H of zero. Okay, that means at standard conditions. Okay, that's... If you remember, if I said it, I'm not sure if I did, it's 1 atm and, two, and 25 degrees Celsius or 298 usually Kelvin they use. Okay? So in any case, those are the standard conditions. But under those conditions, we're getting these values. So we look at our uh, uh, H2O liquid. Our H2O liquid is uh, right here, 285.83. Then we also produced sodium chloride, and because it's aqueous, it's a Kardashian wedding, and that means that the chloride ions and the sodium ions are not really together. They are separated, and the energy it takes for these to become ions is negative 67.7 from their elemental states, and there they are. There's your chlorine, and there is your sodium. And if I look at the collective amount of energy from the products, I can see that there's a lot more energy released in forming the products than there is in forming the reactants. So I have a collective energy of the um, value of the reactants and a collective cumulative energy of all the heats of formations of the products. And what's interesting, because these are what? Uh, state functions, as I say, the path is not important, just where you start and where you finish. So interesting enough, I can take the heats of formation and I can what? Use them for the overall reaction. Now clearly, energy is going to go down. We're going to get more stable because collectively, all of the heats of formation is more negative or I should say a larger negative, meaning more heat was released in forming these elements from their elemental state, or forming these compounds from their elemental states than the reactants. So as the reaction heads left to right here, what we're going to find is that this is an exothermic reaction. And we're going to find that the overall energy is going to drop from the reactants to the products, which means that my products being more stable, there's a delta H that is going to become negative here. And that delta H we want to become negative to show that energy was lost by the chemicals. Which chemicals lost it? Well, obviously, as we go left to right, these reactants become more stable. I know that by the heats of formation. How much more stable? Well, what's the difference between these values? Well, if we subtract them, and you may say, well, what, who do I subtract? Well, I want to show that this is dropping. So therefore, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this number, which is the products, and subtract it from the reactants. 
And the reason that I use that convention, and it is a convention because we want to show that the energy drops, this will give me a negative number. So 693.23 minus the collective energy of all the heats of formations of the reactants gives me a negative 175.33 kilojoules per mole. And this is the delta H of the reaction. Wait a minute. We used heats of formations, a entirely different reaction. These heats of formations of these elements were from terribly were from far different reactions than the reactions of different compounds in the above reaction. I'll say that again. Each one of these elements, or I should say compounds, I keep saying that, are were made from very different chemical reaction when they react together. Yet they're linked. Why are they linked? They're linked because the pathway is not important. Because they're state functions. Right? All delta H's are linked together. Because they're all starting where? They're all starting at this baseline of zero. And because of that, knowing that step, knowing that they're all linked to this zero line, and that's the reference point, that's how they're linked. Knowing how far away you are from that reference point for each individual chemical can be collectively gathered to measure how that changes for the entire reaction. That is Hess's law. We're able to use tablature of heats of formation and compare that into reactions that have nothing to do with the reactions that were used to get them. What I mean by that again is heats of formation. Look at this. Heat of formation of uh, methane is carbon and two hydrogens. This is an entirely different reaction if I make methane react with oxygen to give me, C to give me CO2 and water. It's a whole different reaction, yet I can use the heat of formation of this to come up with the entire heat of reaction. That's as Hess's law, that all delta H's are linked because they're starting from a reference point and they're based on stability. Okay, So when we do delta uh, heat of reactions, there's a very simple formula that's given to do that. And what we say is the del oops, what we say is the, uh, look at this reaction again, what we say is the delta H of the reaction is equal to the sum of all the heats of formation of the products minus the sum, all the heats of formation of the reactants. And I've got to put this little, little circle here that means at standard conditions. And why do we do products minus reactants? We do so so that our convention of negative sign means that energy had to be law had to be given off in order for something that's not as stable to become more stable. We're going as we go left to right, these products are more stable. Energy has to be emitted that's equal to the difference of that stability or energy. So that's the link. That's what Hess's law is. Okay, and if we look one more quick example, okay. Look at graphite H2O. These are elements. This is the what? This is the baseline. Okay? This is the reference point. So, graphite becomes uh, propane here. The heat of formation, this is the heat of formation of propane. C, H, and O somehow are used to make what? Propane. The O I don't care about because it's an elemental. It'll be zero. It's zero here. It's zero here. So, this step is the heat of formation of propane. This step, taking these elements and making CO2 and water, is the collective number. This is the heat of formation of what? CO2 and H2O. But careful, careful, careful. Notice all I did was take one of them, right? It was one NaOH, one H2O, one of these. And the reason I considered only one of them is because in my balanced equation, I only had what? Coefficients of one. Remember, heat of formation, or this is a state function. It has to have a real starting point, a reference point. When it comes to the energy, 
it has to be per what per mole or per something so if you've got three co2s it's three times the heat of formation so this number from this point to reflects the heat of formation of three moles of co2 whatever that number is and what else and um, four moles of water so you have to times that so when you're doing this equation where you're solving for the heat of reaction, you have to consider the moles of each in the balance. Because there's only one here, I didn't have to do so. Very important you understand that. But anyway, getting to my last example, I know I'm getting long here, sorry, but I love this stuff. Okay, so if you look, this is CO2 and water. And, and if CO2 and water, the collective heats of formation, and that's this difference in energy level. So we have this energy level for the heat of formation of CH3, and we have this energy level, this drop, for the collective heat of formations of CO2 and H2O. And what's really cool is, no matter if I go directly from what? My graphite, my H2 and O to CO2 and water, right? These are the elements that all make CO2 and water. Or I first make what? Propane, and then react it and combust it with oxygen, I still get to the what? Same final resting place. So no matter how I go, no matter what pathway I use, again, no matter what pathway I use, whether I go straight down or I make a quick stop and make what? Propane, which by the way is not as stable as CO2 and water, but definitely more stable than the individual elements. And I go from this unstable compound and burn it with oxygen, and that given off from this position, gets me to the final spot. The difference of where you start and what? Where you finish is a state function. Whether I make my, whether my pathway is two stops or one stop, it's going to be the same energy level. So that's what's cool about this. All right, and that's why delta H is important state function. If we were dealing with just Q of P, we couldn't do any of this. It's just a pathway. So you're going to go on into your worksheet, and you're going to do, using the tables I have posted, do the, the summation of the moles of each product listed. Careful if they're aqueous, you have to find the ions. I did post a couple of different uh, um, uh, forms, I mean tables to find that and go through that. And, you know, and that's how it works. So that is what Hess Law, it's the interconnectivity of the starting and stopping using a reference point, not caring about which path you take. Point one, graphite.